I'm honored to introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Gary Schwartz, <laughs> who will talk. Um, Dr. Gary Schwartz will talk about the topic of his book, The Truth About Medium. Gary Schwartz, PhD, is a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona. And he's the director of the Human Energy Systems Laboratory. After receiving his doctorate, uh, doctorate degree from Harvard University, he served as a professor of psychology and psychiatry at Yale University. He was a director of the Yale uh, Psychophysiology Center and co-director of the Yale Behavioral Medicine Clinic. He has published more than 450 scientific papers, including six papers on the journal Science, which is the most renowned journal in medicine. He co-edited 11 academic books and is the author of The Energy Healing Experiments, published in 2007, The God Experiments, 2006, The Truth About Medium, 2005, The Afterlife Experiments, 2002, and The Living Energy Universe, 1999. His research integrates mind-body medicine, energy medicine, and his spiritual medicine. His new book, The Sacred Promise, How Science is Discovering Spiritist Collaboration with Us in Our Daily Lives, was published in 2010. Lately, Dr. Schwartz has participated in the Spirit's events, and we have been so fortunate to have him in the U.S. Spiritist Medical Congress, the third and the fourth events where he enchanted the audience with his scientific finds uh, on health and spirituality. spirituality. Please welcome Dr. Gary Schwartz. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I must confess something that I wasn't quite sure why I was invited here. I wasn't quite sure why I agreed to be here. <laughs> uh, partly because I'm very busy and um, as you know, traveling takes time. It's much easier to do things today by, by Skype or Uvu or, than it is to be here in the physical. But it was my sense that there was, there were multiple reasons why, if you'll forgive me for saying so, spirit or my guardian angels wanted me here. And I came to understand by having the privilege of hearing uh, this morning's panel discussion about Andre Luis. And also it became clear to me about why the title of this talk was chosen because I wasn't asked if this was the title that I wished to speak on. <laughs> and I've never given a talk with this title um, for this particular book. But in listening to the, um, the, uh, the presentations this morning, it became clear. Also, I was curious about, here I was invited all this way to be here, and then I'm given essentially 45 minutes to give talks that usually take at least an hour and a half. So I knew I couldn't even give a normal talk. And now I understand why as well. So I will, um, I'm going to, uh, there are slides here that I'm going to skip right through because they're not appropriate. But I now have clarity and inspiration for what I would like to, uh, to share with you. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on one area of this work which has to do with the concept of energy and our detection of energy and how it relates to spirit and how it relates to the future awakening of humanity that is i.e. in the physical about the importance of of the greater spiritual reality and our role in it. 
Now, I, I should share with you that the truth about Medium Book, I, I doubt that most of you have read it. Um, it was a book, very briefly, that was concerned with uh, not just the truth about Medium, which was actually related to a TV show, but it was actually the truth about mediums and mediumship and the greater spiritual reality. And there was a lesson that I have learned over and over as I pursue this work, and that is I've never met a medium who's 100% accurate. That in a research context, I'm talking about in a research context, about mediums attempting to receive communication from what you, the language I heard here is discarnate, or the uh, formally physical, as I now prefer to call them. Um, the, we're not 100% accurate. But of course, we're never 100% accurate about anything. If you were to ask me, and could I take a test and pass a test on all the content that I was hearing mostly for the first time of this panel conversation, I would get less than 100% accurate. And I suspect most of you would also. Moreover, if I asked you to repeat word for word, for example, just our last presentation, which fortunately I think was written down, was that correct? Good, so we'll have a chance to uh, hopefully, uh, if not hear it, if this is not being recorded, to at least read it, because I'm looking forward to that. Um, I know as a fact that, I, that save for the few quotes that I wrote down, I would probably mangle some of the words and some of the meaning. So, the question is, how do we improve our ability to receive accurate information and communication? And in the physical realm, we do this by way of technology. And technology is based on energy. And I'd like to briefly share with you a lesson that I learned many years ago when I was a professor at Yale, which not only opened me as a Western-trained scientist to all of this, but more importantly, is part of the inspiration for the research that I'm going to briefly share with you today. And it has to do with a lesson from astrophysics. And the lesson goes as follows. By the way, this is also amusing that the, uh, uh, is Brian here? Are you back there? No, somewhere, where's Brian? There was somebody here called Brian. He's, he's not even here right now. Okay. Just want to make sure, you know, they're talking about accuracy here. <laughs> Brian was referring to how the panel was here. You know, he was referring to it as this evening. As far as I know, this is still the morning. <laughs> I just want to make sure that I'm hearing correctly. <laughs> but it was appropriate that what he was going to be saying, because we're going to be starting with the evening. So here's the lesson. If we go out in the country, away from the city lights, and it's a clear sky, there are no clouds, and there's no moon. We can see hundreds or thousands of stars with the naked eye, right? How many of you have experienced that? Yes, most of us have. And it's, to it's spectacular, right? It's awe-inspiring. With telescopes, we can now see billions of galaxies, each with billions of stars. And all that light's been traveling for millions or billions of years in the, quote, vacuum of space, and it's almost perfectly preserved. There's no evidence of the law of second, uh, second, uh, law, of second, second law of thermodynamics. Uh, it must be very late at night. Um, no. <laughs> the, the second law of thermodynamics showing uh, effects of degradation. Because if there was, when you and I looked at the sky at night, it would be noise and it would just look like mush. Instead, we see a history of starlight going back all the way to the Big Bang. Light, light has a kind of immortality in the, quote, vacuum of space. It's really quite remarkable when you think about it. Moreover, no matter where we look, there's light everywhere. Billions of starlight, trillions of stars, all crisscrossing everywhere in the vacuum of space, and it doesn't get mixed up. And that's just a fact. However, during the day when we look up at the sky, if there are no clouds, it's blue. And the question is, what happened to all that light? What happened to all the thousands of stars we can see with the naked eye? With the trillions of stars that we need telescopes for? Has it all disappeared? Or is it all still there? It's just we can't see it, because we're blinded by the brightness of the closest star in the vicinity, which we call the sun. Well, that is the explanation. 
In fact, that is the explanation why we can't see many stars when we're in Baltimore or we're in Dallas or we're in Tucson, because the city lights blind us to all the lights that's really there. So the take-home message, the sound bite, the inspiration that occurred to me many years ago was sometimes we need to go into the dark in order to see the light. Sometimes we need to go into the dark in order to see the light. By the way, most of you are in the dark. I can't see you up there. I just see a few lighted heads over here, but most of them. Ah, there, I can see some of you. Thank you. I appreciate turning the lights up, if that's okay. Thank you. And now they're back down. Okay. But at least I know you're there. Okay. Now, every medium, every real medium that I have spoken to, and done research with, without exception, has said to me that what they do is they connect with the energy of spirit. They all use that language in one form or another. And the question is, can we use contemporary technology to improve our capacity to be able to re ultimately receive communication from the other side? Okay. And I was really taken when I heard this, the quote about, which I had not heard this term before, of something called a, a psychoscope. Did I, did I hear that correctly? Which was a, I presumed a technology quote on the other side, on the, in, the, in the discarnate side as opposed to the incarnate side, which allows one to see more of our, both our past, present, and future. And I began to ponder, just as we've had the development of the microscope and the telescope, that maybe what we're going to have is the development here of what I'll now today call the spirit scope. And I'm going to illustrate for you some of the research that is leading me to this conclusion and is becoming very shortly, as of May, literally the number one thing that I'll be spending my time on. I'm actually taking a leave of absence uh, from teaching from the University of Arizona for the next year and a half to devote my primary energy to this and then my secondary energy which is probably be about only now about 10 percent of my time to research on the question of healing and applications of healing because I have to put it aside to devote all of my energy to this and now what I'm going to do is go through a million fun slides with lots of data to go here and share with you this device here. Can you see this, what my, the blue pen is? This device is called a silicon photomultiplier system. It is a piece of technology which has become available in the past few, past few years that can detect single photons of light in a, in, a, in a pitch black environment. Single photons of light. This piece of technology is only an inch and a half cubed. It's really tiny. It's cooled to minus 22 degrees centigrade. All of the components, as you can see, are stacked on this device. And if you put this in a box within a box within a box, i.e. something that is pitch black, and now what we do is we ask our collaborating spirits. Um, in the scientific language, I refer to them as departed hypothesized co-investigators. who I've come to the conclusion based on these three books that I've published in the, of research with mediums and life after death. The question is, what happens if, if Susie or Marcia or Harry and many others, as you'll hear, are invited to come into this controlled environment where we have precise measurement of baselines and precise trial length and so on? Can this technology be able to, is it possible to detect their light? Because remember, we're now talking with super sensitive equipment. A single sensor costs about $2,500. This equipment is designed primarily for biomedical applications, for, for, for biophysics and chemistry and, um, and medical imaging. I, I hope that the people who've been developing this technology are not upset that we're now applying it to something that most of them don't believe in. 
So the question is, what happens if we invite these individuals with this technology? And by the way, this is not, quote, ghost hunting or any of those silly, embarrassing, very low level, neither accurate nor uh, morally, uh, what's the word, admirable um, reality shows. Okay. This is genuine science with the goal, the, and it's not a long-term goal, but the goal of giving or giving back voice to spirit, but reserved for, quote, the highest spirits. In fact, I'm very touched, and I don't know, I don't know how this is, and the, but there's a symbol that at least um, the Dallas Spiritist Group uses of, a, of two gears, and there's a blue one and a red one. I don't know if that's for all Spiritist organizations or just for the Dallas Group. Is it just for the Dallas Group? Uh, the Spiritist Council of, for the whole what? For the whole country. Oh, is that beautiful? And do you know who created it, by the way? Nobody knows. How long has it been in, in present? Foundation. So, which was when? Uh, and, um, years, years ago. Uh, it's so touching. I've done so seriously. I mean, you don't. You, this is really touching. Um, little synchronicity. How, by the way, how many of you believe in synchronicity? Okay, I suspect many of you do. Um, I was driving to, uh, to Phoenix with my wife to meet with an angel donor uh, investor for this work that we're doing. And um, there was a truck. I can't remember. I think the truck, oh, it said Daniel. The, the name Daniel's important. And, um, but I had this truck, and the symbol for the truck were arrows a blue arrow, arrow and a red arrow in a circle. And I took photographs of that truck because that symbol seemed very appropriate to me for the kind of work that we were doing, where the blue was, could be seen as higher spirit than the red could be seen in the lower spirit or us in the physical, and it was a feedback loop and so on. And then I come here. <laughs> <laughs> and because this, the screen is bigger than life and I'm sitting up front, I notice those little gears. And they were blue and red. Okay, so anyway, we'll get back to work here. Um, so what happens if we invite spirit to come in? Well, we began doing research under controlled conditions. And we did a series of initial experiments. Here, this blue bar, can you see this? The, the, this one here, this black bar, I'm sorry, it's a blue light. This black bar represents the average number of photon bursts in 300 seconds. Each trial was 300 seconds long, and there were many, I don't remember, 20 or 30, whatever, trials, uh, where we could get the average background, quote, noise, what the computer was detecting with the single sensor. And this was actually uh, in a double box, a box within a box. And so you can see what the bar was here, and this is what, what's called the error bar, standard of the mean. So that tells you what the variability of this was. And then we compare that with a series of trials, multiple trials, where we invite spirit to come into the box. And you'll notice it's much higher. It's about a 80% increase in photon bursts. When beings like Susie or Marsha, people I don't have time to talk about, I would have, not today, um, and you can read about, were invited to go into the chamber. This is the first time ever that we had seen evidence that was consistent with the prediction that in a completely pitch black environment, if spirit collaboratively was going into that environment with a super sensitive device, you might detect some subtle presence, okay? But the immediate scientific question was, but how do we know it's not the mind of the experimenter? How do we know it's not, how it's not the consciousness of the person who's running the equipment? So we then ran another series of baseline trials. That's what this second bar is over here. You'll see the blue light. And then what we did was we asked the experimenter to try to put his mind inside the box and produce an effect. And you'll see that he was, <laughs> no effect. There was no obvious that he could do consciously what he could do when he invited spirits, the collaborating spirits in the box. The third set of trials we did was we got another set of baseline trials. And then what we did was we literally asked the spirits to leave the laboratory altogether. So there was no potential fooling around with equipment or inadvertently picking up their energy. And if anything, it went in the, in the opposite direction. This is not statistically significantly lower, um, but there was clearly 
the only effect that we saw of an increase was when the spirit was invited into the chamber. Well, of course, I didn't believe those findings. And scientists are meant to question things. We are, and we, what we look for is replication. So we did replicate. We began running replications. And I want to share some examples here. Somewhere. There we go. This is now using a triple box, uh, which meant there was even less potential light getting in. This is the baseline for the particular spirit we'll call Suze Sophia, which we'll tell you about in a moment. And this was when she was asked to go into the chamber. And you'll now notice it's more than a 100% increase. And these are many trials, which is why we have error bars. She was a star. The second person is someone we called Harry from a previous study, because I observed that he was seen to be better than, than Susie and Sophia. And when we then did the second experiment with now the triple box, um, there was his baseline, and here was his activity. And you'll see it was, again, over 100% increase. Well, of course, I couldn't believe that. So what do you do? You run another experiment. So this time, we did an experiment just with Harry. And what I did was I invited Harry, and I say I because I was now running these experiments. Um, I invited Harry to, on some trials, produce what, we'd call, what he would pick as a yes response. And then other trials where he would pick a no response. And he would make up what they were, because he's the one who's using all this equipment. And he knows what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing. By the way, as a sidebar, I am not a medium. I do not see and I do not hear. One of my colleagues recently referred to me as the Helen Keller of afterlife research. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when I work with gifted mediums, um, and I never know what they're doing. I mean, it, so technology for me is very important. Um, so we had yes trials, no trials, and baseline trials. And lo and behold, what we observed was, sure, there were differences in the yes, no trials versus the baseline trials for the average data. But when you looked at the temporal patterns of the data, the yes pattern was clearly different than the no pattern. Again, the details of that are not important right now. So I took those three sets of experiments and submitted them to a journal that was open to this kind of research, a scientific journal. And by the way, the journal science is not open to this kind of research. The politics in this field, are, are, in science in general, are embarrassing to truth-seeking. It's very sad. But there are a few journals who are open to this kind of work. I did submit it. It went through peer review, and it was eventually published. It appeared in 2010. However, there was one major criticism of the work, and it was an appropriate criticism, and that is in every experiment that we ran, there was always a human being present running the equipment. I say human as in, in the physical human being running this equipment. And the worry was that somehow the, the conscious or unconscious mind or energy of the experimenter was somehow producing these results. And I said to myself, okay, how am I gonna ever prove to the, the staunch critic, including myself, that they, Susie's, Marcia, Harry, Sophia, and others, that they're really using this equipment. And I began thinking about a cell phone. How many of you, by the way, have cell phones? Please raise your hands. Yes, most of us do. <laughs> it's sort of standard these days. Um, well, most of you know, as a matter of fact, I trust all of you know, that you don't have to be present for the uh, technology to pick up a call, give your message, and record that message. And later, you can go back and retrieve the data and see what information was left, right? Anybody who questions this is now thought as being at least not understanding the technology um, or worse. Okay, so this is assumption. So the question was, could we do the equivalent of this? In other words, could we arrange research where no human being was present when the data were collected and only spirit was invited to be present, following instructions given by a computer, if the whole thing could be automated, could we still get positive results? And I was blessed to have both foundation research money and also a research assistant who is a skilled computer programmer. And although he was skeptical about this work, he was um, you know, in intrigued by the challenge. So we did the following experiment 
And in this case, I was using a, a camera system. This is the chamber, it's closed. The camera's up here. It's a, a low light CCD camera system um, that is cooled to minus 77 degrees uh, centigrade. It is an imaging system, so unlike a photomultiplier, which detects single photons of light, this is a, produces two dimensional images. It is the kind of camera that's used in telescopes for looking into deep space. Okay? It's cooled by this device here. This is when the door was open. This is actually, a, there's a, there was a reflective surface here, so this is actually, a, 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 quote, an illusion. I mean, it's illusion meaning it, it's, it's a reflected light image, which coincidentally is an is a, is a interesting metaphor for how the technology might detect spirit. The door is closed. This is in a completely pitch black environment. And then the room next door is what you, is used to house the, the computer and so on, because it's controlled by an external control room. This particular camera cost $40,000. It was purchased as part of an NIH grant, uh, because I was using this for bio, uh, for bio, uh, bio photon imaging. Uh, all living systems emit very low level light, and I was doing research in this area. And then we used it for this other purpose. And initially, the experiment involved this experimenter inviting two particular spirits, on some trials, Sophia, and on other trials, Susie, to go into this chamber and be in there for 15 minute periods, because you had to use the long exposure here in order to be able to get enough signal to noise ratio to potentially pick up an effect. Now, I, I, I should indicate that when we did these experiments, he was running the equipment. We then got positive results. So now the question is, could we automate the whole procedure? And we did. At my uh, direction, do not memorize this slide. I just want you to understand. So here's how, it, here's how this works in plain English. At 4 o'clock, my research assistant would read a standardized script. And the script would say something to the effect, um, Dear Susie, dear Sophia, we're going to be doing an experiment in the lab tonight, just like we've done before. Please show up at the lab at 11 o'clock in the evening and follow the instructions given on the large screen monitor in the control room, uh, given by PowerPoint about when you should go into the chamber, just like we've done when, you were, when I was here doing it with physical. Because it literally showed pictures and had words and it had MP3 files audio files of the, of the experiment actually giving the, 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 the momentary instructions. And, he, and then he said, okay, please do that and follow the instructions and thank you very much. I'll pick up the data in the morning. He then leaves the laboratory. At 11 o'clock, and of course now nobody's in the lab. At 11 o'clock, the computer is fired up, the camera is warmed up, and then the computer picks a random number so that the actual experiment might begin at 11.15, 11.30, 11.45. So not only was nobody physically present, but nobody knew who in the physical world when the experiment would actually begin. You with me so far? So let's say it starts at 12 o'clock, midnight, at which point the, uh, the PowerPoint comes on and the voice comes on and, and it says, welcome Susie. Uh, we're going to be doing this experiment soon. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad you waited around. Um, for the next 15 minutes, please stay with me in this room because we're going to be collecting the pre-baseline period because you have to get baseline first. So the computer does that, then saves the data, then says, okay, Susie, now please go into the next room, into that chamber, just as you've done before, and for the next 15 minutes, please sit there and allow your light to be received, just like you've done before. And then you can listen, and I'll ask you, tell you when to please leave the chamber and come back into this room. Another 15 minutes goes by, the computer collects the data, and then Susie says, uh, I mean, the, 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 the computer says, okay, Susie, we're now finished. Thank you very much. Please go back into the control room. We're going to collect our post baseline because we wanted to see whether it returned. Okay? Then it was all done. Thank you very much. We're going to take a break, and then the computer takes a break, and then it would be a repeat now for Sophia. And the computer determined who would go first on a given trial, Susie or Sophia. You got the basic experiment. The next morning, the research assistant would come in and all the data would be saved, and then the data would eventually be analyzed. The question is, what did we find? The data were analyzed using what's called um, two-dimensional fast Fourier analysis, which is uh, available so uh, uh, fortuitously and conveniently from NIH. NIH has software called ImageJ, that's I-M, um, A-J-E, 
and then the letter J, all one word. It's free. Very sophisticated imaging software for, for used uh, in biochemical and biophysical and biological research. And so we use that very sophisticated software to do very straightforward analyses to look for structure in the, quote, noise. Okay? What do we find? And this is the average brightness, which correlates with overall structure. Simple way to display the data. Here's the pre. There's the presence of spirit trial. There's the post. That's averaged over multiple evenings of Susie and Sophia. Pretty amazing, isn't it? But let me show you something even more amazing. This is what convinced me that this was real. And let me explain this. These are colorized images of the FFTs, the two-dimensional FFTs, of the original raw data. Okay? This is uh, the, the one on the left that says pre. You can see up here, that's what the pre value looked like. Here's what the post value looked like down at the other end. This is spirit number one, who was Susie. And this was spirit number two, when it was Sophia. And you can see these two are clearly brighter than the pre and the post. And spirit number two is a lot brighter than spirit number one. You can see that, right? You're supposed to say yes. yes. Thank you. Just want to make sure we're all here. Okay. <laughs> here are an equal number of trials, equal number of evenings, but these were additional control data. So we said there was still spirit, there was still pre and post, but instead of it being a spirit coming into the experiment, it would just be a control trial. So you were literally controlling for time in the experiment. Same thing, but you'll now notice, look at the two control trials compared to the pre and the post. If anything, it's showing the decline, just like this was showing a, a slight decline. So you compare spirit versus its control, it's dr dramatic. You compare spirit to no, even more dramatic. Well, of course, I couldn't believe that, <laughs> even though it was very convincing, and so I did a second experiment. And this is the... Uh, the summary of the, there's the pre-value, there's the post-value, and there's the presence of the spirit. And again, once again, Sophia was greater than the, uh, than the controls. Now the question is, how do we explain that? Well, as far as I know, there's only one explanation left, alternative explanation, to this being presence of spirit been proposed to me by a few people who actually believe this. And um, let me tell you what they have proposed. And they are leading uh, sort of, I'll, I won't call them militant anti-spiritualists, but there are spiritists, but they're certainly adamant. I'll say adamant, uh, non-spiritist people. And what they propose is that what's happened is that even though I'm not running this experiment, my consciousness is going into the laboratory, my unconscious, in the middle of the night while I'm sleeping, and is deliberately messing with the data to lead me to the false conclusion, me and everybody else, that Susie and Sophia are affecting the equipment rather than taking control of it for myself. Now talk about arrogance and chutzpah or lack of humility. If I were to think that my unconscious was that, un that powerful, uh, two things would happen. Number one, by the way, there is absolutely no evidence that the unconscious mind can do this in the middle of the night, just for the record. But um, more importantly, if it could, I would do one of the uh, two things. I would either have to now seriously drug myself um, in, the, in the middle of the night, if it was a materialist <laughs> perspective, or I would give up science altogether. And to think that my unconscious mind could not only manipulate all this equipment, but could manipulate all the mediums who are independently validating what the, the technology is doing, plus that my unconscious mind is producing all the synchronicities, including that truck showing up and the gears going back to 50 years, <laughs> it becomes a little implausible. So, is spirit real and can they help us? And of course, I presume that most of you probably believe that spirit is real. And by the way, let me ask you a question. This talk ends at what time? I just want to make sure that I'm on track. At 12, is that correct? Thank you. Could we turn up the lights for a second? Thank you so much. 
Um, people typically hold three kinds of beliefs about almost anything. There's a disbelief, which is a negative thought. There is a, an intermediary, intermediary be, belief of being essentially uncertain or unsure. And then there is belief in the positive. Okay? The, uh, the negative beliefs we typically call, quote, skeptics. I mean, that's how they use in contemporary language. It's not the genuine meaning of the The true meaning of the word skeptic was really questioner, asking genuine questions. But there's essentially, quote, skeptic or disbeliever, then there's agnostic or unsure, and then there's believers. I speak to many different audiences, and I always like to know who the, what the percentage of a given audience is. By the way, I was raised to be a disbeliever. I was brought up in a family where it was ashes to ashes, dust to dust, case closed, and that's the way I was then raised by Western science. So that's where I came from. So anyway, how many of you at this point would say that you are, that you're a disbeliever? Right now you are convinced that there, there is not a greater spiritual reality. Please raise your hands. I don't even see one brave disbeliever in the audience. Do I have one? Okay. How many of you would say that you're agnostic? You're not sure what you'd believe and you'd like to learn more. Please raise your hands. We've got one agnostic. We've got two. Do I see three? I see three. Can I have four? I got four. I got five. Okay, we're getting up there. Do I have 50? No. So how many at this point would you say, therefore, that you are a believer? Now, you're supposed to raise your hands. You only got three choices. So raise your hands. It's got to be everybody else. Okay. Well, you're clearly a, a biased audience. <laughs> and so this is not news to you. This is merely validating what you say, what you believe. But what I'm hoping is that you're not just hearing this because it confirms your belief, but you're actually thinking about it. Because what you really are concerned with is truth. And I heard that talk spoken this morning. That what we should be concerned about is not what we want to believe or what people have told us what they believe. But can we come to a conclusion? Can science help us in this arena? This, by the way, is just something I will share with you momentarily because we do have a moment. You know, the question happens, what happens if we actually engage in prayer? What happens if we actually invite spirit to be of assistance to us? And we do it long distance can effects be observed? And I had the privilege of working with, uh, at, a, at a scientific meeting which was uh, fortuitously held in Tucson. It was Healing Touch International, which is a, mostly nurses who are trained in, a, in various forms of energy healing. But there's a strong spiritual basis to their work even though they don't advertise this fact. The woman who is the current then president of the organization, who uh, also is a a nurse at Canyon Ranch. She's a deeply spiritual woman. She was interested in our doing science related to this. And, and anyway, to make a long story short, we did an experiment where they, uh, she ran a, uh, 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 an exercise where we put up pictures of the laboratory, you know, the, the, just like you saw with the camera and so on, and then invited them, she had then invited them to um, engage in the process of sending loving energy with the assistance of their spirit guides to the laboratory to see whether we could replicate what had been taking place with the, uh, when spirit was invited into the laboratory. And you can see there was the pre, and, uh, and this was, a, was baseline corrected, and there's the post, and there was the, the, the increased brightness um, when they were actually running this, again, doing the same kind of paradigm, which is consistent with the idea that, that we, can, we can, quote, call on spirit and uh, even for healing purposes. So this is what I would like to su suggest to you, and again, this will not be a, su a surprise to you, but it's a huge transformation for humanity, for most of the rest of humanity, a huge awakening. You heard the term spiritual awakening, um, which sometimes, very often, doesn't happen until after you pass. I mean, I, there was an earlier slide that I didn't have a chance to to honor, where when Einstein was asked a question, do you believe in immortality, he said no, and one life is enough for me. <laughs> as far as I can tell, he has changed his mind. <laughs> and the evidence suggests that he is one of a group of people who are now working with us to develop this technology. And I say this as a scientist. I do not say this as a, I, with, I, I say this 
wearing the full brunt of responsibility of having to be able to justify with evidence a statement that I make. I think we're all ultimately, quote, self-scientists. We all engage in, in the, the science of our, of our personal lives. And certain questions we can only ask, answer, by applying the, the scientific tools for the, addressing the laboratory of our, of our personal lives. Um, but I want to share with you about comment about the, the, uh, the Wright Brothers moment, because I think we are entering another Wright Brothers moment. As you know, a little over 110 years ago, there were no airplanes. We human beings did not know whether we could fly. However, and many people have tried and failed, including losing their physical lives. However, in December 1903, five people witnessed the Wright brothers' first successful powered air flight. There were four flights that day. The first one lasted all of 12 seconds. The longest flight was 59 seconds. The second day when they tried to do this, it failed because there wasn't enough breeze. They needed breeze at that time to get initial lift. The third day, it, it, it was successful. And although it was reported in the newspapers, the reality is that people didn't believe it. It took a couple of years and many flights before people finally began to believe that this was true. However, for the five people who were present that day, there was no longer a question of whether the flight was possible. The question was, what would it become? And I'd like you to do a little exercise with me. I want us to imagine that it's December 1903 at Kitty Hawk. There's no fancy lights, no projectors, no laser pointers, none of this. No fancy cars. It's 1903. We're there. Could we have imagined then, in just a few short generations, generations, there would be these gigantic machines carrying hundreds of people, traveling many hundreds or even thousands of miles per hour, faster than any animal or had run or flown, 24-7. Do you realize that last year alone, more than 74 million people flew? Could we have imagined that literally every second there is a plane taking off or landing somewhere around the globe every second. That these flights are extraordinarily safe by contemporary standards. That there'd be a brief window of time where you could get a good meal on a plane. That radio would be invented to come to planes, and then television would be invented to come to planes, and then DVDs would be invented to come to planes, and then uh, noise-canceling headphones and Game Boys, and ultimately computers and now iPads and iPhones, and the World Wide Web. And most amazingly, everyone would take all of it for granted. That's the most amazing part of all. Could we have imagined that then? Well, I don't know about you, but I couldn't have imagined it. Well, let me suggest to you that we are at another Wright Brothers moment in the history of humanity on this planet. Because the truth is that anybody who knows the data that we've published, because we've published these two stud studies, and I'm giving another paper at the Society for Scientific Exploration this June um, on more research in this area. Anybody who knows the data from my laboratory has read the book, The Sacred Promise, or has um, aware of the few other laboratories around the world doing this work. The question is no longer, is this possible? The question is, can we envision what it can become? And how long will it take before all of us take this for granted? That's really the question, in my humble opinion. And I began to wonder, can we envision, for example, the creation of what I refer to as the shift from the cell phone to the smartphone to what I call the soul phone. And I really like the term spirit scope because we're really doing spirit scope work right now because the, the soul phone is going to have to go through the, the soul phone 
booth, telephone booth, before it ever gets to be a, a level of this. But can you envision the point that someday you're going to have a small device and you're going to be able to hold it to your hand and you're going to be able to dial a number and you're going to potentially be able to call your deceased mother or your deceased husband or your deceased grandparent or your deceased child or dear friend or we're going to be able to call Andre Louise or we're going to be able to call Alan Kardec or we're going to be able to call Albert Einstein and you don't have to worry about bothering them because they can screen their calls just like we do. <laughs> they can choose to respond or not. Now, of course, we have to be extremely cautious in having this kind of technology. Because just like a surgeon's knife, it's not either good or bad. It can be used for curing or killing. We now know that cell phones are mostly good, but they can also be used to detonate terrorist bombs. It's going to require increased responsibility, increased morality, increased ethics. I love the term, the, the, the spirit of service. I love the term, the idea of the, 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 the pleasure of service. I mean, the idea that, that, that giving and service is so core to who we are and what we do. And I have to ask a question before I go on to the last part of this presentation. Because I don't normally confess this, but let me ask a question. You, uh, I think it was Patrick who brought, I don't know who it was, whether Brian or Patrick or somebody, uh, used the phrase, you know, the guardian angels. Who, who used the term? Was it Patrick? I'll blame it on you, Patrick. Okay. Um, how many of you believe in the idea of angels? Please raise your hands. How many of you question it? Raise your hands. Don't be afraid. Question it. Okay. Have questions about it. How many of you disbelieve in the idea of angels? We don't even have one good skeptic in here, boy. Um, okay, so most of you believe in the angel hypothesis. Well, I, I confess in the book I wrote, The Sacred Promise, the last part of the book, the most controversial part of the book, and the part of the book that now has me sort of banned from the para, even the parapsychology community. It's very embarrassing. It's okay to do work on your, involving your deceased grandmothers. But the idea that there's some greater spiritual reality and that science can take us there they would still prefer to explain it in materialist terms. I was raised to believe that um, the idea of angels and guardian angels was like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. We all know that those are myths. We all know that those are myths. But I've been forced to reevaluate how I was raised in light of scientific data. And what's really interesting is the evidence that's available suggests that those that we call, quote, angels have more powerful energetic effects and they seem to operate at higher frequencies than, other, than others. And wouldn't it be fantastic if it was true, if it was really true, that there was some parallel between frequencies and energy and, and ethics and higher values, that, higher, that there really was a universe, universal higher concept in some way. And if any group of people are going to be open to that and are going to honor it, it's going to be the spiritist movement. Because you, you talk about it so overtly. And part of the reason I was here this is for me personally, it was not just to be able to share this information and, and hope that it's of service to you, but you inspire me. You give me hope that, was, that we're supposed to be doing this work, okay? And that we're not alone in doing this. Okay? We're not alone, not just on the other side, but we're not alone here, okay? By the way, in my laboratory at the university, we literally have equipment now set up so that uh, on a smaller scale, so here's a piece of technology, it's operating 24-7. 
And there's another computer that can run PowerPoint, so we can even do it when nobody's present. And there's another computer there that's, that's doing audio video recording of what's going on with the other two computers. And all of those computers are on logmein.com, which means it's all free. And you could literally run these experiments. I could run them from here right now, or at least communicate with these experiments. This technology is rapidly advancing. So the question is, why did I end up calling this book The Sacred Promise? Well, there were three reasons. The first reason was the idea, was the promise, that science could actually help us get an answer, one way to, or another, to is there a greater spiritual reality? And therefore, for example, that somebody with the name or, or pseudonym Andre Luis could be trying to educate us after they became, quote, discarnate or transitioned. That we no longer had to accept this merely on faith, but, but science could actually give us an answer. And the sacred promise is not called the sacred proof. The sacred promise is not only can science address that question, but if you look at the totality of the, of the evidence, the answer appears to be yes, there is a greater spiritual reality. That's promise number one. Promise number two is the promise that, quote, those on the other side have made to me and to us doing this work that they are committed to doing this work and that they're going to actively collaborate. Here's the truth. I'm going to pick on Patrick just because I can now remember your name, Patrick. Um, um, if Patrick was going to participate with research in my laboratory in the physical, he would, of course, call and make an appointment. We would then make time for him to show up. He would then fill out human consent forms, which protects him. Um, and it also protects the university. It protects the laboratory so that nothing untoward would potentially happen. He knows all of our intentions. But he would also then understand what the purpose of the experiment was, what we were trying to do, and he would agree to do the best he could to, to share information in an honest, honest uh, as forthright passion as he could. Otherwise, you can't do research. People have to show up. They have to follow instructions. They have to be genuine. It's the same thing with, quote, doing work, quote, on the other side. And the conclusion that I came to is that if I was going to show up at the laboratory, they had to show up at the laboratory. If I set up this experiment and we get collaboration with medium saying that they agree, if it's Susie's turn, she's got to show up. If it's Sophia's turn, she's got to show up. And by the way, the available, suggests, the available evidence suggests that Susie is somebody who lived in the physical, and Sophia is someone who we call living in the angelic realm. That both of these levels are participating in this research. And they've promised to do that. And I think part of the reason that they promised to do it with us is because we so care about doing this for the best and highest good. We so much want to make sure that it will not be abused. We so much want to ensure that it will be done with integrity and respect and honor and care and it not be trivialized. It not be turned into a joke. I mean, airplanes are great fun, but they're not jokes. When I get in that plane, I want to make sure it arrives here safely. You know, soul phone or no soul phone, spirit scope or no spirit scope. But the third meaning of sacred promise was the most important, and it's the one why I decided to write this book and why I feel so honored to be here today with you. And that's the sacred promise that these beings we call the sacred promise team That they're here not just to tell us that there is a greater spiritual reality, that life after death, what we call death, continues. But they are here to be of service, to assist us in our individual and collective lives. See, I was raised to believe that we live in a spiritless universe, that the vacuum is, quote, empty, that the problems we have are our problems, of our making, the solutions will come only from us, 
And when we die, it's all over. Case closed. But what if instead of living in a spirit-less universe, we live in a spirit-full universe? And just as the vacuum we now know is not empty, quite the contrary, it is filled with the light of trillions of stars crisscrossing simultaneously with all of the dynamic evolution that we experience, which includes what we call the physical world, which as you know from quantum physics merely means organized energy and potentials. And therefore, the problems are not our problems as in us in the physical. The problems are in our problems more collectively. When you talk about service in both directions, when we have the two gears, we have the two arrows, we have a limited view of reality by Western science. And remember, there used to be Newtonian physics which was a gear type mechanical model. And then we had relativity theory come along, Einstein's theory, and it was bigger. It was more encompassing and it revealed things that Newton didn't understand. It's not that Newton was wrong, it was just incomplete. And we needed to see it in a new light, okay? And then quantum physics comes along and takes it the next generation. And every one of the leaders, or almost all the leaders, in these different revolutions, they all believed in a greater spiritual reality for whatever their upbringings were, because we're all limited by the exposure that we have, the stories we're told, the translations we read. It's that sacred promise that keeps me going. That this is not just important for us here but it's as important for it is there as it is here. That they need to be of service. You used a phrase, Patrick, about, and I wrote this down, I think it was you, about something how a worker's never gone, never finished or whatever. Somebody said that, and I wrote it down. Um, the, uh, I always say that about Susie Smith that she gives new, mean, you know, new meaning to the phrase, our work is never done. I mean, Susie's busier now than she was when she was in the physical. And she wrote, she wrote a total of 30 books on life after death and so on. It was a, it was a, a lay leader in the, in the field at an earlier time. Now, of course, seeking advice from the other side is no different than seeking advice from this side. You've got to be discerning about whose opinion you ask. <laughs> so we have to learn about how we go about answering these questions. But you, um, you appreciate all this. So I'd just like to leave you with the last thought. Thank you for letting me go. And that is, these are very challenging times but they're times of great opportunity. And either all of you are really crazy <laughs> and that I'm now just hanging out with a wacko group <laughs> or you're seeing the light in your own individual ways, be it as scientists or physicians or as people in whatever walks of life, that you're doing this discerningly and caringly and that we have the both responsibility and the opportunity to help get those gears together, to bring those circles together. And I thank you for allowing me to, be a, to play a small part in this process. Thank you. <laughs>